This series of lectures is called Growing Up in the Universe. Growing up means three things. First, it means the growing up of an individual, like you or me or a redwood tree. We all grow up from a tiny single cell up to a massive edifice of hundreds of trillions of cells during our own lifetime. Secondly, growing up means the growing up of an entire life form on a planet, what we call its evolution. Evolution is a change that we see only when we go through a lot of generations and see each generation after the other. The third sort of growing up is what this lecture is about. It's growing up in the sense of achieving a grown-up understanding of the universe. In order for a life form to achieve an understanding of the universe, it has to have the right apparatus. And on our planet, that means a brain. When the brain has grown very large indeed, it becomes capable of comprehending the universe. And it does this by putting a model of the universe inside itself. In fact, this lecture might have been called How to Put the Universe Inside Your Skull. But long before a brain can do that, it must grow up on its planet through intermediate stages. It serves an apprenticeship of setting up models of much more ordinary, mundane things. Brains never evolve for grand purposes like simulating the universe. Brains begin by simulating ordinary things like food or like the geography around your home. This is a digger wasp which is in the act of stinging a grasshopper. A digger wasp is a solitary wasp, not like the wasps that bother us in the autumn, and it stings grasshoppers or other prey and takes them back to its burrow. Now this represents the digger wasp, and this is its burrow. And every time it goes off and catches a grasshopper, it brings it back and puts it in the burrow to feed to its young. But in order to do that, it's got to be able to find its way home because it's foraging for grasshoppers for quite a long distance. So what does it do? It comes out of its burrow and then it flies around its burrow on a couple of reconnaissance flights, learning the geography of the terrain. Then it flies off quite a long way catches a grasshopper and then brings it back and then uh, goes down into the burrow, comes back out, picks up the grasshopper and takes it in. Then it sets off to catch another one and so on. Each one it catches, it takes down to feed to its young. Now, the great ethologist Nico Tinbergen did a very ingenious experiment. He waited until a digger wasp was down in its burrow, so it couldn't see, then he quickly put four fur cones around the burrow. He waited, and out came the digger wasp, and it flew round and round on its reconnaissance flight, this time taking notice of the fur cones, flew away, picked up a grasshopper. While it was doing that, Tinbergen swiftly moved the fur cones like that. The digger wasp came back with its grasshopper, came back, and what did it see? It saw four fur cones. That's what it had learned were the landmarks around its burrow. So it went straight for the middle of the fur cones. Didn't find its burrow at all. The digger wasp had built up a mental model, a mental map of the surroundings of its burrow. Now, even a digger wasp's brain can do that. But if you want to simulate the universe, you've got to have a much bigger brain than that. And digger wasp's brains aren't up to that. We can easily see that by another experiment that Tinbergen did. Actually, it was first done by the great French entomologist Fabre. What he did was this. And I told you that when the digger wasp comes back with its grasshopper, it briefly leaves it on the side of the burrow, and then it goes down the burrow, and what it seems to be doing there is checking that the burrow is clear, that there's, no, that there's nothing in there in the way. And then it comes out again, and picks up the grasshopper and drags it in. Well, that's what normally happens. But what Tinbergen did was this. He waited till the digger wasp came back with the grasshopper, planted it there, digger wasp went down the burrow. Now, while it was down there, Tinbergen picked up the grasshopper and just moved it a little bit, like that. The digger wasp came out, went to where the grasshopper was, and didn't find it. So it looked around, eventually it found it, and it then 
said to itself, so to speak, right, I've got a, di I've got a grasshopper, I've now got to go down the burrow again. Well, he didn't say again, I've not got to go down the burrow and check that there are no obstacles in it. So it did that. Then Tim Bergen moved <laughs> the grasshopper a bit more. Out it came, back to where it had left it, wasn't there. Looked for it, found it, ah, a grasshopper. Down the burrow again. Uh, it went on and on doing this 40 times until Tim Bergen got bored and just, <laughs> just stopped doing it. So there are limitations to the digger wasp's brain, and in fact, on our planet, there's only ever been one brain that even begins to be capable of simulating the universe, and that, of course, is the human brain. Well, here is a human brain in a rather unfortunate state. It's in, a, it's in pickle. So let's look at a human brain of a, of, of a living person. This very brain that you're looking at on the screen now is at this very moment thinking about a yellow rose. This very brain is now thinking about thinking about a yellow rose. It's now thinking about the Royal Institution Lecture Theatre. And it's now thinking about, well, what's your name? Sarah. Karen? Sarah. Sarah. It's now got a mental picture of Sarah's face inside it. It gets that mental picture through this thing, which is the eye. There's the lens of the eye, there's the retina. There is now a picture of Sarah's face upside down there. And that picture is being transmitted up a great trunk cable of a million wires through there to the back. And the picture of Sarah's face is now projected on the back of the brain there. More mysterious still, Somewhere in here, and we don't know where it could be distributed all over, there is a conscious feeling, a conscious image. That of brain is, of course, my brain. Uh, it was done by a brilliant new technique called magnetic resonance imaging, uh, which is a lovely way in which doctors can now get right inside, look right inside somebody's body without cutting them open and without using harmful rays like X-rays. And I went and had that done uh, earlier this year for the purpose of this lecture. The brain could be called the onboard computer of the body. The body moves around in a big, complicated, three-dimensional world. But the eyes that are feeding the brain with information are giving it two-dimensional information. The two retinas of the eyes are each seeing a two-dimensional picture of the world. What's more, it's upside down. Somehow, the brain manages to use that information to see in three dimensions. Now, would you just do something very easy for me? And this can be done by people at home as well, watching on the television. Just hold up your right hand, please. Just hold up your right hand in front of you and look at me. Don't look at your hand, look at me. And what you'll see is two hands, two of your hands. And these two hands, of course, are the one that's being seen by your left eye and the one that's being seen by your right eye. That's why there are two. But now, just focus your eyes on your hand. Don't look at me anymore, look at your hand. Now you'll see two pictures of me and only one picture of your hand. Okay, that's, that's enough. Um, um, so what's happening here? You, you've still got two images of your hand. There's still two images, one on the left retina and one on the right retina. But somehow the brain has managed to pull those two images together and make them form a single composite three-dimensional image 